Hello, all you positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, which I'm excited to say we're now airing five days a week. Once a week, you can still hear an interview with a different consciousness change maker that is out there working tirelessly to help catalyze change and expand awareness on Spaceship Earth. But now, in addition to the weekly interview, on the other four weekdays, you can tune in to myself and my co-host, Dalian, taking questions from the audience, covering a bit of positive news, giving interpretations of a favorite quote to ponder, and you can hear us ranting about whatever other positive ponderings come to mind on that day. And as you guys might imagine, producing this podcast is definitely a labor of love for me and Dalian. But make no mistake, it takes a lot of hard work to put it together for you guys, especially now that we're doing it five days a week. So if you enjoy the fruits of our labor, please go over, give us a good rating and a review on iTunes. Uh, Subscribe for free while you're at it, of course, if you haven't done that already. Uh, iTunes truly is the holy grail when it comes to podcasting and good ratings and reviews are what help our iTunes rank so that we can gain more exposure in the massive sea of other podcasts that are out there. Uh, Even if you have terrible ADD and don't want to take the time to write out a review, trust me, I get it. I'm a bit of a spaz too, but please take at least, you know, the 9.2 seconds it takes to give the show an honest star rating, which only takes one little click. I assure you it will be very much appreciated by us and that the good karma gods will rain blessings down upon thee for doing so. All right, everyone. On today's episode, I am super excited to have the editor-in-chief of Spirituality and Health magazine, Steve Kiesling, here with me. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Brandon. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely been looking forward to this one. This is a a topic that is uh, very near and dear to my heart and, and of course, the audience as well. Uh, Something that we always touch on to some degree is spirituality. And, of course, you can't get too far down that road without health becoming uh, a major uh, topic of conversation. So uh, having you on the show to pick your brain about these things, and I know it's it's your world day in and day out. It's I'm, I'm very, very much looking forward to it. Terrific. Yeah, so so why don't we start at start at the beginning? Tell why don't you tell us a little bit about your history and how you ended up in such a such a unique uh, kind of niche in life? Okay, well, I was actually raised Catholic. My my mother is um, also an evolutionary biologist, and she managed to keep those things together. And oh went, wow, yeah, I went to church <laughs> until I was thirteen, and uh, but we had a, an interesting family. We uh, the parapsychology research group, which was uh, a group meeting out of the Stanford Research Institute was meeting in our living room. So it, we had people Interesting. who were talking to plants and bending spoons and all kinds of things. That was uh, that was in the seventies. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. We also had a Zendo in the in the basement. There was a Zen priest, a Zen archer, who was he had his office in our basement. Um, that was a weird collection of things, and part of the reason for for that was I went off to Yale and started rowing and became an Olympic rower, which is kind of the opposite extreme. But um, I, anyway, I've been interested in embodied spirituality my whole life. Well, well, that is a, certainly a hodgepodge of <laughs> of different influences. So no wonder you turned out in such an interesting uh, path because everything from you don't typically think of Catholicism mixing with uh, the parapsychology research group. And you said that was taking place. It was Stanford's group and it was taking place in your living room. No, it was Stanford Research Institute. I lived in Los Altos, California. Oh, um, OK. Los Altos High. And anyway, it was. It was uh, Yuri Geller. I don't know if that's a long time ago, but he, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He became I know that famous name. for bending spoons and and also but there was a lot of research into re- remote viewing. The uh, the yeah. idea that you can see things from a distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, a lot of that research was done by friends of the family, and so I mean, very close friends actually. My parents were going to build a commune with some of them, so it was it was a wild time. Wow. And so Yuri was built actually bending spoons in your living room. Yeah. Yeah. That was. Oh, wow. So what, what what was your take on that as a kid? I mean, was it something that was just blowing your mind or was it like this was the average, you know, Wednesday night at dinner? Well, part of it, it was, you know, as my parents were doing it. So um, I think my reaction was, eh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. If mom I mean, and dad's doing it, it must not be that cool, right? <laughs> yeah. And actually, Eric Geller bent my brother's key. 
And I said, wow. oh, so what? And I bent it back. Um, wow. He was pissed. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, I, I mean, it was a really interesting time. But what's, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, looking back at all that research is not much has changed in all of that time. I mean, since then, we've had the Internet. We've had all kinds of things. And sure. so that research is, you know, hasn't gone, really hasn't gone anywhere, which is telling. Now, I saw a guy actually bend a spoon recently, and I was trying to figure out, you know, of course, I'm very open to all things as a possibility and and matter being, a, you know, the potential of matter being manipulated in, in any fashion or form. Um, so it's it's interesting that that was happening in your living room. So is, is what is your official take on it? <laughs> Mike Geller was that. actually doing it? Um, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I... I think you have to ask the question that if you could bend spoons with your mind, why mm-hmm. would you bend spoons? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of that simple. Um, because if you, ca- if you could do that, then mm-hmm. the things that you could do with your mind would just be staggering. And so the idea that somebody can learn how to bend a spoon with his mind, um, I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing. You can, uh, but that has to, I think that has to, more to do with your body than anything else. I mean, one of the things that happened in high school was I was on stage with a magician. Um, and, um, and the magician convinced this girl who must have weighed 90, you know, 95 pounds that she was as, as stiff, of, stiff as a board. So uh-huh. I picked up her head and this other guy um, picked up her feet and we placed her across cross a couple of uh, benches, right? And so she's just uh-huh. this plank, you know, su- supported by her head and her feet on the, and then this magician. With nothing in between. Pro- yeah, nothing between. The magician who probably weighed 160 pounds stood on her stomach. Wow. She didn't bend. Now, when, you know, then I tried that at the time I was on the football team and I couldn't do it. I tried it four years later when I were, a little more than that later when I was on the Olympic team. And I still couldn't do it. Wow. Uh, and that's a cheap parlor trick, you know, by some magician having to do with the body. That is something that a, an Olympic athlete could not do. And yeah. That doesn't. So what that says to me is uh, bending spoons is not particularly interesting. But it does say that there's a lot more in the mind and body that, than we know about. That's that that I know for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he never came out with, "Hey, here's my here's my magic trick and how I'm I'm doing this as an illusion." Oh, he no. left it he's, up you know, to you to determine. Yeah, he he never uh Eric Geller never, you know, he's still claiming to bend spoons as far as I know. Um Wow. <laughs> very very interesting. He made a lot of money doing it. Sure, sure, sure. Now, you also mentioned remote viewing as something that was going on. And and for our listening audience who maybe isn't familiar with remote viewing, I find that topic very fascinating as well. It's not something I've ever participated in or seen firsthand, but I have read some books and and find it to be very fascinating and its origins with, you know, being uh, created, uh, I think, if if I'm not mistaken, by the government. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and what that experience was like for you as well. Well, what I knew of it was it was again in the seventies, and uh, anyway, a close friend of the family, Russell Targ, was working for the Stanford Research Institute, and they were being funded, I believe, by the CIA ultimately, and because the Russians were involved in in mind research, so we did too. Right. And anyway, so government spent a lot of money trying to figure out, you know, doing psychic research, and it, you know, various mm-hmm. people have written books about it, but some of it's some of it's pretty easy in that you, you essentially have somebody hide an you know, put an object in a box and, or a bag or whatever. And then you, if, if you're the subject, you clear your mind and, and try and draw it. And the point yeah. is to, you know, and it's a pretty simple procedure. You, you just clear your mind and you try and draw it. And that's where it gets weird because, um, you know, they did, they had some drawings done by people who were, uh, who spent a lot of time doing remote viewing that supposedly showed um, like a crane at a Soviet missile test site that they didn't even, they, it was confirmed by a spa, spy satellite. 
So right. if, you know, if you believe the drawing, here's this guy sitting in Menlo Park, California, looking at a Soviet spy installation and drawing what's there. And I mean, that's, that's pretty remarkable. And, and the research went on for quite a few years. And every time that somebody would come in to shut it down, they would basically, the person who was in charge of shutting it down would then, you know, they'd say, well, here, why don't you try it? And that person would then succeed at his own remote viewing experiment and say, hey, there's something here and keep funding it. That's, sure. that's the story I, you know, I grew up with. And, and it's really tantalizing. And, you know, I've done remote viewing experience, experiments myself, just, you know, goofing around mm -hmm. and been fairly successful at it. Um, and at the same time, you run into the problem of, you know, our, our memories are associative. And we and what human beings really do is just make up stories all the time. So we're always yeah. seeing connections, drawing correlations. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, there's been a lot of research about remote viewing. You know, suggesting that it's it's more powerful than chance. And at the same time, again, it it hasn't gone anywhere. You know that yeah. that research was now done 40 years ago, and you know, now people just pick up their cell phones and, you know, and have spy satellites and all that kind of stuff. And the question is, well, why didn't it turn into anything? And then it really asked the question, you know, was it, was it anything more than, than just um, the associative property of the mind? And I'm still on the fence about that. Sure. Um, so. Yeah, there's uh, a book and I can't remember, I want to say it might be cosmic explorers or something i read many many years ago and it was very fascinating because it was a a guy who i believe if and it's been a long time since i read this book but i believe he was trained by the military and he started remote viewing different um you know uh, events in in history and you know from you know things that maybe happened thousands of years ago or even it went so far as to like extraterrestrial races and entities and things like that so it got pretty far out there yeah. uh, with some of the things that were being remote viewed and you know it's it makes for a fascinating story nonetheless i i don't know if it's true so of course as soon as you mentioned this as something that was taking place in your in your living room i very quickly being as interested yeah. i am in these kinds of yeah. subjects wanted to pick your brain on it and it's one of those things where i mean it's kind of like um you know there's an old line if you're not a if if you're not a communist when you're when you're 18 you have no heart and if you're still a communist when you're 35 you have no head right <laughs> and there's something about that i mean i think an interest in parapsychology especially when you're young is really useful because it whether or not it's true it's this pursuit is asking you or allowing you to think in ways that are not um that are different you know yeah. And at the same time, you know, there's a certain point where uh, where believing in that stuff too much just goes very badly. Um, yeah. I lived for a while actually with a psychic um, and I was in part because part because she was <laughs> she was very attractive and fun. <laughs> also, I was, I was really interested in, you know, is this real Her abilities? Yeah. And, and she was very, you know, empathic, and and sure. so the you know the emotional connections were 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 very powerful and and very interesting and fun. At the same time, uh, you know, I listened to her, and you know, she she made her living doing phone sessions with you know with clients who would pay her you know two hundred fifty dollars an hour or whatever to right. give psychic projections and. One thing I noticed that I would tease her about, I said, you know, everybody you're talking to is a, is, who calls in is a higher being. Do the lower beings ever call in? <laughs> and, and, you know, that's really telling because, you know, the people who are psychics are, you know, they're, they're selling a service at a lot of money for some of them. And, sure. and the service is really to make you feel good. And, and they're, yeah. the good ones are very empathic, but. Are they actually connected to anything? I don't think so. Yeah. 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 You know, well, that's interesting that you have that perspective, especially with your upbringing. You know, my personal 
perspective, having had some interactions with people who claimed psychic ability, um, you know, there's, I've had, I've, I've had both. I've had some things that seemed very kind of hokey and this person's really out to get a paycheck. And then I've had a few instances where it was like, wow, how could you possibly know that? You know, like I, I remember graduating, um, when I was just about to graduate college, I was planning to move to one of the very strong considerations was moving to Chicago. My uncle had a business there and working with him and things like that. And this woman said, I see you in a cold place like Chicago working in business. And I was in Atlanta, Georgia at the time. Well, my jaw hit the floor because that was my number one plan, you know. And then the next thing out of her mouth was, well, though, are you involved in music in any way? There's this whole other path in California. Well, a year later, um, you know, with the help of uh, some psilocybin mushrooms, I decided <laughs> I wanted to be a musician and make music. And then next thing I know, I met someone from California who had just moved to Nashville where I was living and said, oh my gosh, you guys need to be out there with your band. And we came out for a visit and voila, here, you know, 20 years later, here I am. So, um, so, you know, I don't know what that was. I know in her case, in what my perspective on it is, is there's there's alternate timelines that, ha- you know, time is an illusion. There's alternate versions of, of Steve from this moment forward, of Brandon from this moment forward. And it's someone who truly has that ability is tapping into the potential use. You know, it's kind of like a video game. It's already in there. It's already happened based off what you choose depends on what version of you shows up in your movie. And that's, that's my personal take on it. You know, I've had some other very psychic events that have happened to me personally, um, Mm -hmm. where, you know, like the day my grandfather passed away, having full vision of that happening, looking at my watch to see the date that he would die. And he wasn't in the hospital or anything. He just had a heart attack a few hours later. So, But I've also seen exactly what you're talking about, where it seems like, you know, for a while I had those experiences early on. So I was I would go, you know, every year or two to visit a psychic. And then I had a few experiences that felt hokey. And I said, okay, anything that ever comes through is going to be very organic. Uh, I'm not going to seek it out anymore. I'll let it seek me out. And that's (laughs) been kind of my take ever since. So, Uh, yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting stuff. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And I think people have to, you know, kind of decide for themselves. And I think that's one of the interesting things about it is it is so much on the fence of what's going on here is, you know, is he bending a spoon? Is it a trick? Is is there something more to this person standing on the middle of her stomach and she's stiff as a board? Is it mind over matter? You know, we've shown that that is certainly a, a real phenomenon where we're altering reality. I, I think that, uh, you know, part part of the difficulty with the, um with a lot of the, the psychic stuff is that, and, and religious things as well, is that in, in some ways they end up being simple, fairly simple stories for, I mean, they simplify the world. And what's really, what's really fascinating about the world is actually how complicated it turns out to be. I mean, the interactions, mm-hmm. you know, between ourselves or between various you know, the whole environment is so complicated. Our genetic structure is so complicated. Um, you know, physics is so complicated. And, and then we, so we create these really simple stories in religious stories or psychic stories that, yeah, that are, that are just, um, they kind of grossly simplify everything and make it actually less magical than the, than kind of the scientific reality of it. Which sure. is kind of too bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's an interesting perspective. It's, um, yeah, I think in one sense, I, I, it's almost like everything. It's, it's in one sense, it, it's infinitely complex. And on another, it's, you know, you're looking at everything that you're looking at as a, as a light is a projection. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of evidence that it's holographic in nature. The, the particles that make us up are these vibrations that are at their root fundamental essence, all the same stuff. So in, <laughs> from that perspective, it is simple. It, it's all just the same stuff, you know, re- formed in, in different configurations. So, well, that was a very interesting uh, beginning to our podcast here. I didn't expect to get into all that right off the off the bat, but uh, I'm glad we did because it's a it's a topic that I love to to talk about. So, um, why don't you tell us a little bit, um, you know, more about your history? I find that's really interesting. You mentioned that you were an Olympian as well. I, I wasn't a, I was not aware of that. Yeah, I, I actually went off. To, I went to Yale and I was studying philosophy, uh, religious uh-huh. philosophy. And I, but I also started rowing on the crew, and it was a time. Well, the, the Yale crew hadn't been very, hadn't done very well for a while. But for whatever reason, in the late seventies, just this phenomenal bunch of people showed up, 
And I just walked onto the crew as a freshman, having never done it, uh-huh. and ended up spending my, my senior year. Um, I got, took the year, well, I got into a special program where I was able to write a book about the philosophy of sports while training for the Olympics, which is basically uh-huh. what, like, my senior thesis. And it was pretty far-fetched, except that um, what happened is I was able to spend, you know, not just devote myself to training, but also to devote all of my life, to, you know, thinking about training. And I had the whole resources of the university behind me. So I ended up writing this book called The Shell Game, and it became a bestseller, and I made the Olympic team. Unfortunately, it was 1980, so we didn't go to Moscow because of the boycott. But, but it, right. was still, it, it was an example of what happens if you can actually put your mind, body, and to some extent, your spirit all in the same, you know, in, into alignment. Sure. At that point, remarkable things can happen. Uh, and that, I mean, that was my own experience. And then, and it seems like remarkable things have happened. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, then, um, at, I, so I graduated and the guy named, uh, T George Harris, the guy who uh, started psychology today magazine back in the late sixties, he was starting a new magazine called American health. And so I was hired as his fitness editor. And so I spent the eighties as a magazine editor learning about, you know, about fitness and, um, I was a, a, a spokesman for Nike cross training and a lot, you know, really into the, you know, sort of the, the feeling that the world could be saved by jogging, um, you know, yeah. running marathons. It was an inter- really interesting time because the, in the eighties, the feeling was that the, um, you know, it was an explosion of interest in the body that the body could be recreated at, at any age. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then the '90s was the decade of the, you know, decade of the brain. It was the first, uh, this sort of the beginning to realize that the, uh, you know, that neurons are not limited; that they regenerate at any age. Yeah, and and that actually became the story that uh, that launched spirituality and health. We launched uh, again. T. George and I launched this in uh, in the late '90s with um, actually funded by Trinity Church Wall Street, which was pretty amazing. Wow, because the church—I mean, the the church was turning three hundred. They they started Columbia University and some other things. Been around a long time and had a lot of money. And the rector at the time kind of realized that. Uh, I mean, his his major realization was that progressives in any religion have more in common than they have with each other than they have with the fundamentalists of their own faith. And basically what that means is that the stories don't really matter. Um, if you're a progressive Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever, your, your chances are you can talk to other progressives and you won't have any problem because you're, you're I mean, the stories are, the, the stories of your religion may be, may be way different, but your outlook yeah. on the world probably isn't that, isn't that different, you know, compared sure. to dealing with the fundamentalists in your own religion. Um, who can drive you nuts or may kill you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, or both. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I sh- that's a little bit harsh, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, the, the rector decided to, to start a non-Christian magazine. I mean, to, to look at spirituality, um, you know, that it wasn't necessarily attached to religion. And, and by that time, you know, I was a long way from being a Catholic. Um, I was just yeah. curious about, hey, what's the truth of it? And, um, so we had a, um, you know, for seven years, the church financed us. Uh, they spent a couple million dollars a year on it. And then we, be- we, we eventually became a, uh, you know, the rector retired and now we're a for-profit magazine and still plugging along. But uh, here, 20 a- years, almost 20 years later, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really been amazing um, because it, it means spirituality I define it and uh, you know I, and I get this it's, it's an old definition but basically it's total aliveness um, and, and and you know how you know how do you that's the states of total aliveness and sometimes that you know that's a mystical thing that you have with you know 5 meo DMT or it's um, right or it's something you do you know 
winning the you know at the world championships or something like that. I mean, sure. how do you, you know how do you be how to be totally alive in all these different different ways? Um, and you know, and and be open, be open hearted, and all of these things. I mean, it's it's um, so it, it, the search is really fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a key, key point that you touch on there, being open hearted, because so many it's so easy in today's world to have a closed heart. You know, you have you have struggles and hardships and life happens and life happens, you know, and the hard stuff happens, your heart gets closed more and more and more and more. And I think that's really your connection to spirituality and whatever spirituality is, is for you, yeah. you know, for any given person. I think one of the great, you know. The great things about, I mean, Catholicism is a great religion, and the new Pope, I think, is doing wonderful things. But basically, Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, it's talking about taking care of the poor, and, and you look at all these Catholic hospitals and all, you know, I mean, you can tell, the Catholic Church has done all kinds of horrible things, I mean, but, uh, you know, historically, but it also has done amazingly good things and continues to do that in the you know, in the world, in the, in the real Christian tradition of helping, of helping people. And yeah. that's something that gets lost in a lot of the, um, you know, the, the kind of new age spiritual stuff. And, the, and even the, you know, a lot of the meditative things that are happening, the mindfulness, um, yeah. you know, I, there, the mindfulness, you know, compassion and all those kind of things. It seems like they're not doing such a, you know, they're not building hospitals at the same rate as the, as the Catholics. Um, yeah. Yeah. It seems to be more of a personal, you know, a personal journey, this personal spiritual journey with, uh, and it seems easy for people to get caught up in disregard for their fellow man uh, yeah. when they go, go that path. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's, it certainly can happen. Um, I mean, and all these things are, you know, we, we pick and choose uh, different bits of spirit, you know, you know, spiritual, things, you know, there's kind of this smorgasbord that you can pick from. You can, you study yoga and mindfulness and, you know, throw in some chanting and some um, prostrations. I mean, there are all these things you can try and they're all, they're all interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot out there. That's for sure. And and I want to touch on a few of them to see, to, to kind of, you know, delve in a little bit to your perspective. Of course, when we talk about spirituality and health, um, that encompasses a, a lot of things from food to medicine to healthcare, you know, of course, spirituality, as we've touched on a little bit. So I would like to maybe just cover a little bit of each of those topics and kind of see what your perspective is. For example, you know, uh, Starting with food, um, there's there's a lot going on these days with GMOs uh, versus you know organics and and you hear all this talk about companies like Monsanto and and things like that. I'm curious what your thoughts are. You know, I talked to someone recently who's making the argument that hey, GMOs are necessary to sustain this many people and they're not really bad. And um, you know, and then of course you have uh, people who are diehard about you. You know, organ. You know, you must have organic. You get rid of all those pesticides. So, what what is uh, Steve? Your thoughts on on all that? <laughs> that's a that's a tough question. And I, that's I, a big one. I know. Yeah, I, you know, personally, uh, GMOs are are probably necessary to feed people. I mean, we have you know <laughs> there are people starving all over the world. Yeah. Um, does that say that Monsanto isn't evil? Oh, I, I'd say Monsanto is pretty evil. And right up there. And and I and so I think I, I think the battle against GMOs is really important, not because the battle is gonna is going to stop them, but because it's a really important battle to to slow it down as much as possible. Because yeah, I and mean, we are dealing with things that are that are dangerous, and we're dealing with people who are really slimy and awful. I mean, that's there's no question about it. They, yeah, uh, and and at the same, I mean, I'm not saying everybody at Monsanto is that, but that's certainly the they ride roughshod over people in just horrible ways. And at the same time, I think you know they have people the, the researchers doing that kind of work have succeeded in feeding millions of people and saving millions of lives. Yeah. Uh, and that's, and that's driving them as much as, you know, as much as the profits. So I think it's an important fight, 
And I also think it's it's important to you know, I'll say that Monsanto is evil, but it's it's important not to demonize them because you know they're people too. Yeah, they're playing a role, and yeah. whatever that role is, it's it's something that's meant to play out, obviously. And yeah, and yeah, um, it takes yeah, two sides. A tough one, you know. And I think you know the pesticides in foods um, for most people are not significant, you know. And what the one of the great things that happened, I mean, right now, um, well, McDonald's is switching to uh, cage free eggs. Cage free eggs, yeah, I saw that. And that's that's a wonderful thing, and that's because the that's backlash, the right? Because people have been fighting for it. Yeah. And, and that's that's a big win for a lot of chickens. And, and, and yeah. it, it was there's still a long way to go. I mean, you know, and as an overall thing of spirituality is that is, I think, you know, in a sense, we're returning to a much more indigenous kind of spirituality. I live where there's a we have a actually a Native American salmon ceremony that happens in our backyard. But, um, but basically, they're talking about the, you know, salmon people and the tree people. Um, and I mean, we're. Animals are, you know, we're just another kind of animal. And as we recognize that, then we treat our food better, you know? Sure. Um, And and that's, and that's really, I think that's a really important, you know, spiritual thing. You know, everybody thought that the, you know, that having one God was great progress. I don't think so. I think actually um, getting rid of that one God is real progress and realizing that, um, you know, that, that we are part of nature. That's, that's, sure. a, that's a much more profound realization that has the benefit of being true. Yeah. Yeah. That we're an inextricable part of nature. And if we're um, abusing and having disregard for this extension of self, those reper- you know, we're ultimately going to feel the repercussions of yeah. that. Right. And we're seeing it. <laughs> the world is changing fast because of us. And, and I mean, the sooner, you know, the more we take care of other creatures, I mean, and the more concerned we are with other creatures, I think the faster we wake up to the, you know, how important that is for our own survival. So, you know, so that kind of spirituality is, you know, it's just, is really important. Um, Yeah, you hear a lot about, and I don't know if you have any thoughts or insight into the statement that, you know, once the bees die, and of course they've been dying in droves because of these pesticides and so forth, we're soon to follow. Yeah, Um, it's... (laughs) There, you know, at this and at the same time, I mean, again, some of my own history. My dad went to work for zero population growth in the in 1968. That was Paul Ehrlich's. Um, uh, he wrote the population bomb, mm-hmm. and, which was basically saying that the world was going to be so overpopulated by the time, by this time, that we would all be dead. I mean, not quite that dramatic, but just about. Yeah, um, it, you know, human beings have this 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 terrible. Um, need to have the end of times coming, you know, yeah. it's always, you know, Jesus is up there on the, up, up on the, cro- you know, the cross thinking that, you know, that the kingdom of God or this new thing is going to happen, you know, right then. And, yeah. you know, we're a long time since then and um, it hasn't happened, but, you know, there's still this, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. And whether it's, I mean, there was global cooling in the seventies, which was, which was wrong because of the particulates went away. That was just a brief thing. I mean, global warming is real. And at the same time, you know, human beings are remarkably resilient. We'll figure this out. I, I have no yeah. doubt. I hope, I certainly hope you're right. And I know a lot of other people hope you're right. It is yeah. true. We are, we are as resilient as they come. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Man, we're, there's, we're, we're pushing the envelope on this one. Certainly, <laughs> yeah. certainly. And and there's some hope as far as some of these things that we're talking about here, as far as, you know, paying closer attention to what you eat. And, you know, of course, uh, you mentioned McDonald's moving to cage-free eggs. And, um, you know, there's just been this whole, uh, I guess, f- people uh, in droves leaving fast food, you know, not going to fast food or buying, you know, coca-cola and things like that is that something that you foresee continuing and ultimately those companies uh you know having to change up the way they do things or you think that they'll be replaced by more conscious organizations you know companies are changing and there's there's no question about that they're you know, McDonald's is becoming more responsible just be, because they have to because the food they have they produce is mostly garbage and yeah more and more people are waking up to that and 
designed to make you addicted to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, things are definitely changing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would definitely, definitely agree. I, I just curious if you, you know, kind of what your thought was, if you, if you foresaw them, you know, making the change quick enough to, to survive or they would ultimately become obsolete, you know, it's also, it's a generational thing. I mean, I, I'm 56 and mm-hmm. the, you know, my son who's 18 has, I mean, he's already a lot further along the road than I am in some ways because sure. he's, he's grown up without a lot of the baggage that I have and also just – and more aware. You know, even the, in, in the last five years, the environmental concerns have become so much more real than they ever have been. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, well, they, I mean, there were things like, well, nuclear war that was, that was hanging around in the 60s. And that was <laughs> – right. That was real, but – this is this is kind of the new version of that, um, yeah. As opposed to Y two K or something like that. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That that that's a that's a good comparison. Now let let me ask you let me ask you this. As far as the whole you know sustainability of meat and vegetarianism or veganism, you know, versus people saying you know, of course, you have to have the protein and and meat, meat, and then you have the people saying, look, it's not sustainable. It's it's you know, with the number of people, what are, what are your thoughts on that whole topic? <laughs> I mean, personally, it's, it's, you know, Lord, make me a vegetarian, but not yet. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I live in, um, I live in rural, rural Oregon and, um, and I live on the rogue river and the, you know, the, we have, you know, salmon is a really big deal. It's the, um, it's the keystone species here. It's the um, the sacred species of the Takelma tribe, which lived here. I mean, literally, we have the salmon ceremony that happens here. Mm-hmm. It's a huge part of the economy, and and then you have vegans saying, "Hey, this is it's immoral to eat fish." And I'm thinking, you know, get a life, right? Um, because I mean, these are. I mean, we have these. There's a ceremony that dac- dates back thousands of years, and I mean it's and it's very honoring to the salmon, and it's and it's really important to the environment and to the economy. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, um, there are a lot of uh, we we did an issue in the magazine about um, it looking at the paleo diet, which mm-hmm. in some ways is really you know absurd because it, you know providing meat to everybody is so grossly inefficient. And at the same time, I mean, there are a lot of places where growing meat, you know, growing beef or having chickens makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that, you know, the cows are, they'd rather be, you know, live their lives and be eaten than not exist at all. I, so I, the, be, the vegan thing, um, I don't know, there's a, great, there's a great tendency to want to be holier than thou. And, yeah. and that drives a lot of it. Um, is my sense I'm being, <laughs> that's really unfair or maybe it's sure. because I'm, you know, I'm personally weak and I can't do it. <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I just think, you know, a lot of the world lives on bugs, you know, insects yeah. and, and they're happy to eat them and to make any moral judgment about somebody, you know, abusing a bug just seems really seems clueless. Yeah. Um, and does that, does that forgive factory farms where 95% of our meat comes from? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and that's actually the problem is you have, I mean, and I'm, you know, I'm putting down the vegans because I mean, it really, it, it, in another sense, I really admire people to do that because I admire that kind of dedication as long as they're not trying to make me feel bad. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a big problem. I think that you've, you've pointed out is you can, it's so easy when you start down this path of, you know, holistic, uh, you know, uh, a holistic lifestyle. And then it can very quickly be a slippery slope to judgment of what someone else is or isn't doing. And, you know, for me personally, I, at this point I'm pescatarian and I, like you, you said, I, I admire it. I, I would love to be eating, you know, nothing but, you know, fruits and, and vegetables and so forth. It's, it's difficult. So for me, that's kind of where I've settled for now is pescatarianism. And, um, you know, what really pushed me over the edge, I don't, edge, I don't know if you've ever seen the documentary Forks Over Knives. And it, it uh, was really compelling, you know, studies that had shown that 
you know, essentially to sum it up was that m- meat proteins are, are the cause of most heart disease and cancer. Now, of course, I'm sure there are people that debate it and, and everything like that. I haven't seen that. I, I you know, I read the, um, I just recently finally read the China study, which is really an interesting book. You know, same, yeah, they talk about that. Yep. Same idea that, that if you, if you, Animal protein, you know, causes all these problems. They could identify in China where the problems would be based off of their diet. If there was more meat protein, they knew there would be this much heart disease and cancer. If it was plant based, they would it would be practically non existent. And and yeah, they use that China study, which is I believe one of the largest scale studies ever done. Yeah, with, and that's you know, millions. Of people. I mean, it's really fascinating. And at the same time, if you look at you know people. I mean, there's, you know, the, the, the great, the, I mean, they even have the graph of the French paradox with basically, you know, the people in France who are eating quite the opposite, who are mm-hmm. doing just fine. Sure. And, and then you go, well, okay, so, I mean, as a, as a choice of how to live, you know, do you want to live like a rural Chinese or like a, a person in Provence? And right. both of those look like they have the same life, you know, life expectancies, cancer risks and whatever, doing completely different things. And, you know, given a choice, I'd rather live in Provence. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I know. And, I hear you. You know, so it's and they don't you know, that's one of the things I, 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 I mean, I think it's really it's really interesting that people are so different. I mean, I know that I, I mean, I've spent time on a completely vegetarian diet and and I actually felt great um and at the same time there's nothing like the 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 nutrient density or the rush of eating a a really good steak I mean but that's if everybody's doing it then that's going to destroy the earth so I mean yeah you know it's I mean anyway what what really shouldn't happen it, it what we don't want is the ethical meat eaters fighting with the vegetarians because both those groups are very small. I mean, you're talking about a couple of percentage of the pop- population while 90% of the country is eating, you know, factory fed beef. And there's no question that that is destroying the environment, you know, it's terrible for the, for the animals. I mean, it's just bad. So, yeah. you know, I, I think, it, uh, you know, in that sense, we're all better off being vegetarians. There's no, no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. And for me personally, and, and this is strictly a, 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 just a personal feeling is, you know, when you think about what some of in this factory farms, especially you've got, you know, a pig, for example, highly intelligent. I've heard claims as, you know, with the intelligence of a three year old, they know what's happening to them. They know they're walking into this slaughterhouse. They're releasing these stress hormones into their system, you know, before they die. And, you know, of course, this gets very, you know, I guess, uh, spiritual perspective, so to speak. But I personally think when you're dealing with an animal going in, in under these awful conditions and there's all this fear and negativity surrounding it, it you're that vibration is is encoded in, into that animal. And then, you, of course, you're ingesting it. So that's something that there's a little less to show as far as, hey, here's a study that happened in China or, you know, Norway when the Nazis invaded. That's another one that they use in forks over knives is you know there was x amount of heart disease and and cancer the nazis came in and took all their dairy and beef and you know all their meat and they went to plant-based proteins Uh, heart disease and cancer like uh, plummeted uh after the war they got their their meat and dairy back and it skyrocketed again so that was one example that they used and of course those are great examples and like you said there's people who will give opposite examples and say hey well what about this what about the french and and so forth um but from something from a purely you know spiritual perspective and a very personal perspective that's one uh reason that i have felt like okay i want to try and step away aside from the sustainability problem and so forth i mean i think that's a good i mean that's a really good thing and we have a lot of the local stuff here is you know grass fed beef, and we have you know cows around here who they have very good lives. Yeah, and I mean they they do fine, and then you know at, at a certain point they get killed and eaten just as they have since time immemorial. But right, and I I don't I don't think that that's I don't think that's wrong, but at the same time that is so rare you know, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's, it's just a drop a, in the bucket. Yeah. Com, you know, compared to the way other animals are treated. So, um, you know, part of it is, I mean, where I live, um, 
it was it was the the centerpiece of the it was the center of the Tacoma Indian universe on the Rogue River. There's some big rapid called Tillamook Falls that stops the salmon. So there was a big village here, and they would everybody would gather here and do this salmon ceremony. And um, that culture was so tied into the earth. I mean, the river yeah. was seen as the you know the lifespan of you know the it, sort of the model of the the, the 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 people were the people of the river and the I mean the, the whole mythology of the of the tribe here was um, was about kind of being one with all the with the rocks and the animals and all that kind of stuff and you know personally I aspire to that as a sure. way of of living um, rather than than saying you know, making up rules where I can't eat this or I can't eat that. Um, no, it's just how do I, I mean, how do I be in the world where I do the least amount of damage? Sure. And I, I'm not saying I, I do a good job of it, but that's my aspiration. Well, I think that's a good one. What is your thoughts on, you know, and this is kind of going to the next little, uh, I guess, natural progression of our conversation. I mean, what is... Your thoughts on the current state of the the healthcare industry and alternative medicines and so forth? Well, I think it's really interesting, uh, and we and actually in our next issue, our uh, November December issue, we have a, a a really an interesting piece about that by uh, 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 an MD friend of mine. And one of the thing, one of the most I mean, the most fascinating things going on in medicine right now is um, is called you know is the N of one research. Do you, you know about that? No, I'm not familiar. Okay, so, you know, basically most of the gold standard of modern medicine is the double-blind uh, trial, right? Right. Where you're testing a medicine and and I guess the first the first big medical trial was in the 1940s and I can't remember what it was for, but anyway, you know, they you have a you have the actual drug and then you have the placebo and nobody knows who takes what and you do it you know, hopefully with thousands of people, and then you figure out statistically, well, this actually worked or this didn't, right? So that's, yeah. that's the gold standard of, of modern medicine. And, and it's done some amazing things. But even, I guess, in the 50s, there was a statistician who pointed out that, you know, if you stop to think about it, when you're, taking a, when you're actually taking a medicine, you don't really care. I mean, the only, the only thing, you're just concerned about yourself. It's not that, you know, the N is the number of people in the study. Uh, so the N might be 100, and that's pretty good, but 1,000 is better, and of course 100,000 is better still. Sure. But, but, it, but ultimately, when you're the person taking the pill, all you care about is N equals 1 equals me. You know, does this? Right. And, and that's when you, and when you start to pick out some of, the, some of these, you know, the gold standard studies that have been done, you realize that the number of people it takes to take a pill, you know, to get an effect is pretty large. Like there's one statin, you know, a cholesterol drug. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the notion is that for, if, if 24 people have to take this thing for one person not to have a cardiac event of some kind, right? Mm -hmm. So if you really stop thinking about it, well, 23 people are taking it and it's really not going to make a difference in their lives. But at the same time, they're suffering from significant side effects, whether it's muscle pains or, you know, early dementia or whatever. I mean, there, there really come some serious side effects to these things. And, and yeah. the question is, how do you, how do you figure out if that pill is good for you? And, yeah. and, and how do you make an informed decision? And that's one of the things that's, that's happening is, is the idea of, okay, before you take a pill that you're going to take for a long time, maybe you should run your own placebo experiment, you know, working with your doctor or just by yourself. And there are people who are doing this and you can get mm -hmm. all kinds of gizmos and gadgets, you know, blood sugar monitors or heart rate monitors, or heart rate var variability monitors, all these things that are now available. So you can do a lot of really sophisticated testing on yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could say, well, I don't want to bother with that. Just give me the pill and lower my, um, you know, lower my blood pressure. But if you're talking about taking a pill for, you know, the next, the rest of your life, and that pill is going to have a, 
some serious side effects. I mean, first of all, if you're me, you don't want to take the pill anyway. You just rather figure out some lifestyle choice. And uh, sure, I mean, I don't take anything at all. But if I had to, I mean, if I some the doctor said, "Hey, you got high blood pressure and it, and your exercise and your diet is not taking care of it," then I want might want to set up my own n equals one experiment where I'm taking a placebo for a week and then the drug for a week and just alternating and doing that for you know a couple of months. Um, and where nobody knows which, you know, which one I'm taking and, but I'm writing down what it feels like. And, and meanwhile, the, you have your monitor measuring your blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. And at the, you know, after a couple of months, you, you look at your data and go, well, heck, you know, during this week, I, I really felt terrible, but it turns out I was taking the real drug and my blood pressure was down and. And the week that I felt better, I wasn't taking, I was taking a placebo, but my blood pressure was high. Um, I mean, that might be a result. I don't know. But, but that sure. way, I mean, you're collecting data about yourself. And I mean, the reason, part of the reason for doing that, is, of course, is the pharmaceutical companies um, lie a lot. I mean, they, Absolutely. there's so much money involved. You know, they, they invest billions of dollars in research, you know, to try and do something good. But at the end of the day, they got to sell it. Yeah, and and they're going to tell whatever story they can to get you to buy it. I mean, I, I think, you know, and, and a lot of the pills are really helpful to people, but they also, you know, they have these. They come at a cost, whether it's you know just the cost of buying the pills, or it's the side effects, or the fact that it doesn't actually do you good any good, but it does somebody else. Yeah, what's happening is it, it's now becoming possible for us to really take responsibility. For our, you know, our own health in more sophisticated ways, and actually figure out, okay, do I want to take that? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I just had a conversation with my mother earlier today. She's had stomach issues for for many, many years, and she finally found this doctor who is, you know, seems as she thinks, you know, this guy is like a saint. He's he he uses all alternative medicine, herbs, and things like that. And one of the things that he discovered was this bacteria in her stomach, and she'd been through all these extensive, expensive, um, you know, doctors in the past, and she she was just dumbfounded that they never discovered what he discovered and why they didn't go the route, you know, 10 days into taking these uh, natural herbs, you know, that it cost barely anything. She's uh, feeling way better than she felt in years. And, you know, his, his input was, well, they want you to do cat scans because they're expensive. They want you to do this because it makes money. It's, you know, it's just, it's, it's such a crying shame. I, I actually interviewed uh, the director of, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the sacred science, the documentary that came out a few years ago. And, uh, you know, he made an interesting point is 25% of the drugs uh, that we have uh, are coming from the Amazon. Uh, and 1% of that stuff has actually been studied. But a lot of times they overlook these things because they can't patent a plant. And I think that is, it's just a sad is state of affairs when we've got an industry that will overlook things that really help people. You know, here my mom is now going to this person who, and you know, by uh, conventional standards, is would be more primitive. Uh, you know, doing things that don't cost. He's not. He's not getting rich because of his approach. Yet she's really being helped for the first time yeah. uh, after years and years of suffering. And uh, yeah. thank goodness for people like him. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's true. That's true in a sense. It's also. Um, I mean, they're different things. Like so much of medicine has gotten so good. You know, if you, you need a yeah. heart valve like my mom did. Oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just breathtaking what, what modern medicine can do. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things is we, you know, we blame the phar- pharmaceutical companies for selling us this crap, you know, these um, statins or whatever. And, and that, that, that have these, you know, terrible side effects and, don't do that much good. Yeah. But I mean, the simple fact is the reason we're, you know, they're selling us that stuff, but it's because we're, because most people are eating such garbage. Sure. And, I mean, I, I see these ads for heartburn medicine where, I mean, you can reduce the, the symptoms to zero by taking this medicine, but guess what? Those symptoms are <laughs> telling you something, which is don't eat that crap. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe the 12-pack of glazed donuts is a bad idea. I don't know. Yeah, just, you know 
If you eat that, then guess what? You have to take this medicine, and that will disguise the discomfort. But, <laughs> right. But meanwhile, the damage is really being done. Sure. And then you know, then but you can't blame you can't blame any. At some point, you can't blame anybody but yourself. At this point, for eating the crap that makes you take the pills, you got it. I mean, come on. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I mean, the spiritual search, this whole thing about being aliveness, is just aliveness is to become really sophisticated about what your body wants and needs. And and that's hard to do. But I mean, a lot of the probiotic stuff, um, like kefirs or kefirs that the, mm-hmm. you know, come from Armenia and places like that, uh, uh, this fermented milk products, I mean, they're just loaded with these probiotics, which, I mean, do, I mean, they not only strengthen the, your immune system, but they decrease anxiety and all kinds of things. I mean, no wonder these people live so long. I mean, they're they're really powerful and they're, you know, you can get them at any health food store and what the heck, yeah. they'll make you feel good um, yeah. and cure all kinds of things, <laughs> including sure. acid reflux and stuff like right, that. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's definitely uh, something that's, you know, it takes two to tango, I guess, so to speak. And um, it definitely requires some changes in our own behavior if we're going to sidestep a, a lot of the, the nonsense that is out there in the. Yeah. You know, and it, it's again, I mean, one of the other sides, like the, the, you know, the raw fruit food craze that I think is already kind of ended. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, there was a great book by a, a Harvard guy who's studying chimpanzees. Uh, oh, about the use, use of fire, and I can't think, uh, can't think of the title off the head. But basically making the point that one of the great evolutionary leaps was cooking food because it makes so many vitamins more, you know, more readily available. So we spend less time digesting. Right. And, and if you think about it, uh, and, you know, a cooked egg turns out you get a lot more nut- nutrition from a cooked egg than you do a raw egg. Um, and that's true of a lot of vegetables as well. And so, again, if, if you're thinking about actually you're worried about global warming and you want to, you know, make the least impact, well, you want to get the most bang for, you know, the most vitamins out of your food, which means cook it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, it, the raw stuff, so much of it, I mean, we're not, we're not that good at digesting raw food anymore. So it just, we just flush it down the toilet. Yeah. Um, I mean, that could be healthy too, but. I mean, I think any extreme, you know, belief like, oh, I got to eat raw. It's you're just asking for a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, the key to a lot of this stuff is finding that that moderation, finding that uh, place that is not obsessive, that is uh, coming from a really healthy, healthy place and uh, and healthy perspective. And I think a lot of times it's looking within yourself and saying, hey, what do I feel about this? Forget about all the things that I've heard, you know, take them with a grain of salt, of course, to some, you know, listen to them to some degree. It's none of it's gospel. Now, what do I feel? And I, I personally believe that's the most important thing you can do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the whole, I mean, that's this, this whole N N equals one, you know, do these studies, go for, you know, say, okay, I'm going to spend a week eating, you know, this kind this way or that way, or I'm going to take this pill or I'm going to, I mean. But actually pay attention and, you know, check your, your blood sugars and your, you know, heart rate variabilities and all these things that are now, I mean, the, the gizmos are pretty inexpensive. You can gather a lot of data if you want, um, but also just write down how you feel and, and it's possible to learn a lot. Um, and if you, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people, if you, if you're taking a, 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 you know, a whole bunch of different prescriptions, you know, it, you talk to your do- doctor, but maybe think about, okay, for a certain amount of time, I'm just going to go off all of them and, yeah. and see what the baseline is. Or if you're taking, yeah. you know, I mean, we had one, a, a nice article on the current issue about a guy who, you know, who'd been taking antidepressants for 20 years and, and through a wow. process of ayahuasca and, I don't know, learning to play the banjo and a few other things, he finally realized he didn't need them anymore. What do you think about entheogens such as ayahuasca for healing and self-healing? Well, I think um, I, there are a lot of things that just that really help to, um, you know, to, to change your frame of reference. 
they're they're different, you know, different things. Ecstasy is it can be useful. Um, ayahuasca can be useful. Um, and I mean, there and there's good. And there's now good studies saying that that they'll help with trauma. They'll help with all kinds of things. They just post traumatic stress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think they're actually they're very useful. And at the same time, they can be like everything else oversold. Uh, yes. Um, if you if you do these things a few times to um, or, or you know every you know at, at long intervals to kind of, you know refresh yourself or that's one thing you know or the, or the Native American church with peyote you, you do that every so often and it's really helpful but you can if you start to believe in it too much start taking it taking it every uh every day that ends in why you might have a problem <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, yeah there's, uh, you know what are the, uh, there was an interesting study that well kind of a study where i'm just talking to a lot of you know wise people about about the source of wisdom mm -hmm. and it was interesting that none of the entheogens was on the list i think as a path to wisdom they don't get you there um I think as a, because you don't learn much. It's more, it's an experience that maybe allows you to learn in other ways, but it doesn't provide a learning experience. If, you, if you're taking drugs because you expect to become wise, that's really a bad idea. Um, yeah. But if you're, but sometimes, you know, if you're stuck or, or if you just want to experiment and, you know, and you have the right situation where it's safe and, um, it's a really useful and helpful and powerful thing to do. Yeah, I think the only tie-in you could probably give as far as wisdom is, you know, perspective shift. So you're looking at things from a certain perspective that maybe you've been conditioned to look at, and all of a sudden you take ayahuasca or, you know, psilocybin mushrooms or something, and next thing you know, you've got a whole different perspective on this matter that uh, creates a positive effect and i guess yeah. could be in some way uh, considered to a wiser viewpoint of a situation so not necessarily that new information is coming in but that a alternate uh perspective is is being presented if you have been if you've been traumatized you know by whatever war or you know whatever violence or i mean that that rut can become you know just so inescapable um because everything everything is gets drawn into association with that particular rut. And then you take a really powerful entheogen and guess what? You know, you do that a few times and, and suddenly that rut is not so deep anymore, just by the way, by this reframing. And that's, that's sure. enormously helpful. And that, it seems to yeah. work. Yeah. Yeah. What is your thoughts on, you know, illness and disease and it, its correlation to uh, a, a per a particular mental state, you know, someone who's been depressed or negative for many years and all of a sudden, you know, now they develop, you know, whatever awful disease. Do you believe that all things are psychosomatic to some degree or? Well, a, a yes and no. I, I think, you know, I, I've seen, you know, there've been back in the day there, you know, charts saying, well, if you're, you get breast cancer, you, it's because, um, I don't know. You have these thoughts about, and I, I think that's really nonsense and not helpful. Um, I think a lot of cancers are, you know, are most, you know, they're they're genetic and bad luck. You know, it's it's all this. But you you know you have Steve these these um, new research. I don't know if you're familiar with like Bruce Lipton uh, in biology of belief. You know that you're actually turning genes off and on based off belief. So a lot of times we talk about genes being these static things that you're stuck with, but actually, you know, there's evidence yeah, that I mean, you change yeah, those things. I, I think that's, I mean, I think that's true. And, but I, I think it, but I mean, I think the specifics of it are very difficult. I mean, to say, well, this, this belief led to this cancer. Uh, right. Right. Absolutely. To pigeonhole but, it is, is definitely but, a slippery slope. But I think, uh, and you know, my my personal belief is that the greatest thing you can have for your health is a passion to do something. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're driven, um, if you're driven by a cause, um, yeah. to and especially if it's a cause that is larger than yourself, I mean, to help the world or whatever. Yeah, um, that is the most. That's the healthiest place to be. 
because you got purpose, uh, right? Yeah, you have a. I mean, having a purpose is is just enormously healthy because I mean, it's it's telling you, it's telling your all these genes to be fired up to you know to do things, and yeah. and that's if you're in a, a fight or flight response all the time. I mean, that shuts down your immune system. So if you're stressed out all the time, you can you can just drag yourself into all kinds of horrible diseases. But at the same time, if, if you can have, you know, have a positive purpose that really is worth it, makes it, you know, makes you excited to get out of bed, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's a constant and, and, and people around you who, who support that or people you're working with who support that, whatever it is, that's the best, you know, that's the best health um, insurance you can have. Yeah. In my sense. As far as you had mentioned that you're you don't really take anything, and uh, as far as medicines and so forth, and that's I think that's a huge accomplishment. Um, what is your secret? I mean, what you know is yoga, meditation, are these things that you work into your daily regimen, or you know what what are some things that Steve does? <laughs> Rowing. <laughs> yes, you still row. Yeah, yeah, I'm going. Oh, to that cool. Charles, um, uh, uh, racing next uh, i mean it basically you know it you know my my health secret or what works for me is that i mean really for the last well for the last 25 you know, 23 years anyway i've had one one eight man crew that we and we row in the san diego crew classic in april mm-hmm. and then i have another crew that races in boston at the head of the charles and and then there's also a rowing club, the Ashland Rowing Club that I belong to, that we I race with some. But but the main point is, at least a couple of times a year, I get together with these guys, and we don't see each other the rest of the year. But we we come together for this race, and it means that I have to um, I have to stay in shape, and mostly that's on on my rowing machine or uh, or you know doing other things. I mean, I'm pretty active, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing commitment. And these are, I mean, fortunately, these are really, the boats I'm in are mostly former Olympic or national team guys. And, and there's, so there's a lot of pride and we're trying to win and all that, but mostly it's, it's just, it's the same guys showing up, um, and doing these races and, and, and being determined not to, not to get out of shape. And I don't, you know, I, uh, rowing is actually a, a really great exercise. I mean, I think it's the best there is. It's a, you know, it's a full body thing. It's very yeah. meditative. Um, I've written books while I was rowing, you know, I mean, essentially <laughs> just rowing along and thinking, you know, thinking coming about, up with the concepts. Yeah. And, or, and then there's a certain point where you can't think of anything because it gets hard. And then it, and then it's, that's another kind of release of, yeah. of rowing hard enough where you just can't think of anything pushing yourself to the edge. And that's, uh, years ago I did a, uh, worked on a book with, uh, Dan Goldman, you know, did the, uh, emotional intelligence book mm-hmm. back, in, back in the eighties. We worked on a book called the relaxed body book. And there was a, basically a test, a test for people who were kind of muscle, uh, or body types and mental types. And, you know, when it came, and there's some people who, you know, who meditate and just love it. And it, and they go to s- spots where, I mean, they, they learn, you know, all kinds of good things happen. And then there are people like me who, when I meditate, I mean, I can get there sometime, but mostly I just don't like it. It's, it doesn't work for me. And mm-hmm. I would much rather row. Um, An active meditation. Yeah. Active meditation. And, and I think, you know, I think they're actually very similar. Uh, there's, you know, there's no, there's no baggage in rowing about, you know, trying to achieve enlightenment. Or well, I don't know, maybe there is, but mostly just trying to, <laughs> um, right. but, uh, but it is, it, anyway, I think it's really important to, you know, for me, I've been very fortunate in that I've, I've found my, I found the thing I love early on and I've been able to stick with it and, you know, and, and it's also something where I've now been rowing for 40 years and, I've never, you know, never been injured significantly from it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've never not been able to row. Um, yeah, so that it's it's a good thing. Yeah, it sounds sounds like a you've 
as you said, you, you were very blessed to find something early in life and something that made sense to stick with. It's not like if you had, you know, picked up a football at that age, you would probably still be out there playing full tackle football. So, um, you know, it's something that's low impact and working yeah, every muscle. So yeah, the other, actually the other side of that is, um, and in some ways what I used to, and I still do this, is, is whitewater kayaking. Um, I mean, because rowing is, is, is you're trying to, uh, it's trying to achieve perfection. I mean, a perfect stroke, right? And, and you're ideally it's flat water, everything is controlled and you're, you're trying to do the same motion just again and again. I mean, obviously you have wind and waves and stuff, but basically it's very controlled. And then, and, and that's, and, and so all you're trying to do is it, 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 and it rewards effort. So it's, it's how do I maximize, how do I work as hard as possible? It's kind of, that's yeah. what rowing is about. It's how do I work really, really hard, go backwards? Yeah. Um, but then whitewater kayaking is, is a completely different way of being in the world because now you're dealing with forces that are just infinitely stronger than I am, you know? And so I'm in these, you know, going through these rapids and it's all about, trying to be aware of what the river is doing and, and knowing that I can't outpower the river. All I can do is, I mean, ideally I figure out how to work as little as possible to get where I want to go with, you know, and stay upright, you know, as easily as I can. And it's anyway, with the flow, right? Yeah. It's a, and it's a great combination. Just learn, you know, or, you know, if you're, or surfing is the same idea. It's like how to, how do you learn to, um, you know, how to learn to deal with things that are, you know, just so powerful and, and sure. have fun in them, you know, and abs- absorb that, you know, just sort of feel that energy flowing through you. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like a great, uh, a great pastime that you've picked up and, you know, just that that example of trying to find the path of least resistance and kind of going with the flow with this thing that is much greater, uh, more powerful than the self. I think that's a, that's a great, uh, kind of analogy for, for life in general. And, uh, it probably has a lot to do with, uh, you know, these, these super healthy exercises that you found, uh, I, I think is no coincidence that you've had such a interesting and su- successful life. So maybe, uh, people hearing this podcast will be inspired to pick up rowing or whitewater rafting after kind of hearing your story. <laughs> right? You never know. You know, I, I, I had a, uh, an interesting conversation with, a, um, one of the guys at Kripalu, um, the, the yoga, um, the great yoga school up in, um, uh, Massachusetts. Anyway, it's a great place, mm-hmm. but and here's a guy who's been, you know, he's my age and he's been doing yoga his whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, he, and it was just, it was interesting that, you know, we just had this conversation where I was saying, well, um, okay. So uh, and he, and he's very fit. He eats all these healthy foods and that he, you know, he, I mean, he looks like he's in great shape and, and, sure. and, he, and, 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 and he is. And, and I said, I was thinking, well, so am I. But we we're all also saying, you know, hey, you. I said, well, you wake up with aches and pains. He said, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> so do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, and that's. I think you know, that's just that's the reality of it. Is that you know, some things get more and more difficult. I mean, I get on my rowing machine and I know what I could do back in the day, and and I can't do that anymore. And um, and I'm really grateful that, you know, that I can still row and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but, you know, part of it is just realizing, I mean, you got, you just got to keep going because it's, um, because it's, it's the most important thing to do is to, is to, you know, is, is one, you know, have a passion that you're really excited about and, and have, and have an exercise, whether it's yoga or, or rowing or whatever that you, you know, that you just keep doing. Something to keep you, keep you active. Yeah. Super important, I would say. So Steve, this has been really, really interesting uh, conversation. I I certainly have uh, enjoyed hearing your perspective on, on all these different subjects and I'm sure uh, my audience as well. Um, One thing that I always like to ask uh, towards the end of uh, my podcast uh, is a story. Do you have any story of synchronicity or serendipity or a positive paranormal uh, story that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> oh my gosh! Wow. 
I mean, I, I've, I've had a lot. Of, there have been a lot of synchronous, synchronous things in my life that, and and I I've, I've followed them at times because because I think it's it's just helpful, you know, to have that kind of enthusiasm, whether whether you know whatever it is. But one, but there was one time when, um, uh, oh, 20, 25 years ago, when I mean, just everything was going wrong. I was. I was getting sued over a book and my wife was, my marriage was breaking up and my friend was dying of AIDS. I mean, it was just, it was just one thing after another. Yeah. Everything, everything happened at once. I mean, sort of, I had this, I'd been living this totally dream life and it suddenly all, I mean, it just all collapsed at once. And I moved in with a friend of mine who was a priest and I was, so I was staying in the uh, rector of this church in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and it was the feast of the Epiphany. <laughs> I've oh, been wow. drinking a whole lot of scotch, and I woke up <laughs> in the rectory and just terrified. I mean, I had never been so scared in my life, and and I I, mean, I just had this sense of evil. And I, um, anyway, I was so there. I was just in this in this uh, the rectory of well, this room at the rectory terrified and then i looked up and the whole room was glowing and uh-huh. you know what it was i think you know was the sec- security lights off you know off the snow you know that's one explanation because they were really bright and that but it was this it was this kind of magical moment of like wow um, yeah i mean i i just I, and i'm basically an atheist but in that moment i was going wow god exists or there is I mean, there is a light that is more powerful than any darkness. And um, anyway, it was, I, I, even now I can sort of explain it away as, well, I don't know, anxiety or whatever, a panic attack. And at the same time, that was an experience where I, well, oh my God, this really is a, a wonderful world. Of, you know, where, yeah. you know, good things are, the light is a lot more powerful than, than the dark. And I, I'll, I'll hold on to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great thing to hold on to. And, you know, it's there, you hear lots of stories like that where someone has hit kind of rock, the rock bottom and then has some sort of a, you know, what feels like to them a a mystical experience that uh, is, you know, at one in one shape or another, it it is shining a light into the darkness for them and, and seems to have such a profound impact. So that's that's a beautiful Beautiful story, and, and I'm sure a lot of people can can relate to to being there. So, um, thank you for sharing that. So, once again, Steve, you know this has been really wonderful speaking with you. I really appreciate you coming on and and to let me kind of pick your brain on all these different uh, fascinating subject matters. Keep up the great work uh, that you're doing over there at Spirituality. The, the SpiritualityHealth.com is the actual uh, website, and spir- Spirituality and Health is the magazine. Um, so, yeah, guys, I strongly encourage you to go pick up a copy and see the great work that Steve and his crew are doing over there. And um, one last question I will leave you with, Steve, to put you on the spot uh, in 60 seconds or less. What is the meaning of life to Steve Kiesling? <laughs> oh, the meaning of life. Well, I, I mean, I think it really is is total aliveness. Um, I mean, trying to figure out what that is in, in all the different ways, whether it's, you know, physical or mental or environmental. Um, I mean, there's so many fun things to do and so many great things to learn about. And, and so I, I, you know, I guess I'll go with, uh, you know, I'm not, inter- I'm not really interested in the meaning of life so much as the experience of being alive. And I think that, I mean, I think those two are really the same thing. So beautiful experience is, uh, is, is definitely a meaning in uh, some sense. So thank you so much for sharing, Steve. I appreciate you once again. And uh, as for all of you out there listening, remember to subscribe to the Positive Head podcast on iTunes and give us a good review while you're at it. Also, check out PositiveHead.com where we have brand new wares and other really you know cool stuff for you to check out. Otherwise, until next time, remember... As long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Be well, everyone.